First up, we have Dr. Analgesia Georgia, who's uh, highly regarded both in the UK and abroad for her work in Italian women writers and for her edited publications on European women's writing. She's a recognized expert in Neapolitan narrative and well known here because she is um, among the founders of the Center for Contemporary uh, Women Writing and a member of the, the steering committee. Um, and she's organized many interdisciplinary conferences and on southern Italy and Italy in the 1970s, European women writers um, uh, notably, and is, uh, uh, we're very happy to have her as part of the editorial board here at the Journal for Man Studies. Just a, a couple of uh, publications for you to go and, go and read. Uh, one of them is Women's Writing in Western Europe, Gender, Generation and Legacy. It came out with Cambridge Scholars Publishing and Speaking Out and Silencing Culture, Society and Politics. Italy in the 1970s. Um, so uh, do go and have uh, a look at those and of course all of Adel Jesus' publications. Um, perhaps there are others that I should have pointed out as well. But um, over, over to you. My prologue has already been too long. Okay, thank you for the prologue. <laughs> a very flattering one. Perhaps not entirely deserved, but never mind. I'll take it with uh, a lot of, um, well, your generosity. Uh, there is a handout, if anybody has wants one. Um, probably I may not read all the quotations that uh, are put in there because you always think that you can cover more than you think you can, and probably I will jump some. So please forgive me for that. Um, before I start, I see Catherine put me into this section on the projects, and I feel a bit of a fraud because what I'm going to talk about is a part of a is research that originated in a in a project, but it's a project of the Center for Contemporary Women for the Study of Contemporary Women's Writing, but a project led by Jill, um, in which I. Uh, was asked to participate and um, I, I was very lucky to be part of all the activities of the network. This was the HRC funded Motherhood in Post 1968 European Literature Network which was hosted here by the Centre for the Study of Contemporary Women's Writing. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Jill for, for involving me in the Centre from the very start and for the network. Um, so my talk today is based on a chapter that will appear in an interdisciplinary volume on motherhood in Europe, uh, edited by a group of us, the steering committee of the network, and led again by Jill. Um, and the volume was inspired by the activities of the network, and is a, the, the volume is about to be published to come out with Routledge. So I have. Uh, worked on mothers and daughters on and off for a while and that was one of the publications that is very dear to me uh, this kind of summative collection of essays on national literatures looking at the development of narrative of mothers and daughters post-1968 um, so I was inspired to go back to this topic by the need to go beyond existing interpretative frameworks Specifically, the critique of the exclusion of the mother from patriarchal social symbolic systems conducted by Anglo-American theorists with, within the objects, uh, object relations tradition and by continental philosophers of difference. But I also wanted to find, to go be beyond this framework, wanted to find new writers being tired of young people coming up and still looking at the same writers that I looked in my chapter <laughs> from that book. Um, so new writers who were offering possibly different representations of mothers and daughters in contexts more relevant to the contemporary world, representations that moved beyond the classic fusion versus rejection paradigm with daughters perhaps no longer taking refuge in a lost imagined pre-symbolic mother-child symbiosis or daughters that must abject the mother to avoid psychosis. 
So the work of this writer that I'm going to talk about today um, seems to fit both uh, both these needs that I recognized. Uh, she normally represents external and inner realities forever on the verge of collapse. In post-national context, rife with conflict and splittings. And so what, when she talks about motherhood and mother-daughters, she doesn't seem to fit into those uh, the existing theoretical frameworks. And I found in Bracca Ettinger the alternative I was looking for. Now, I do not claim to be an expert on Bracca Ettinger because she's written a lot, she's very complex, um, and I have uh, perhaps been uh, selective in choosing aspects of her work which fit my brief in, with this particular writer. So I will start with uh, introducing Castaldi and Ettinger, then I will focus on only one of the four narratives that are part of this book, Dentro le mie mani le tue, Tetralogia di Nightwater, Your Hands in Mind, Tetralogy of Nightwater, um, and I will look at this in the light of Ettinger's psychoanalytic theory and artistic practice. And well, we try to draw some conclusions. So I hope I'm going to be able to cover and be also meaningful after chopping, like, you know, with an axe, what I had to in my hands. So I apologize to Jill and Abigail because they know this work already. Um, so this book is a twenty is twenty seven hundred and twenty one page long, consisting of four parts uh, or four narratives inspired by the death of Castaldi's mother, and organized around repetitions of a number of core events, images, and affects related to loss and death. And these stories are set against a backdrop of natural catastrophes, migrations, violence, and war. The first three parts, and I have listed there in the titles in Italian as well as in English, Maria Berganza's Last Night, Amelie Inside the Belly, The Rag Doll, are, uh, recount three different stories of mothers and daughters seeking to reconnect and to re-establish a process of trans-subjective becoming that has been halted by external realities, external events leading to trauma. The, uh, the, they, or the, the three stories take place around one night in 1972 in Nightwater, which is a neighborhood, neighborhood of a possible city, at once circumscribed and infinite. The last part, part four, me inside the night water, forgetting, it's set in a world that resembles a lot more our own, and it takes place between 2004 to 2006, in a, uh, uh, narrated by the author of the first three stories, who engages in an intense dialogue with a reader on the links between narrative and life and on the ethics of writing. The matrix of creativity, which is in my title, relates to um, Ettinger. Ettinger's matrixial theory encompasses psychic, social, and aesthetic processes, and thus offers, I think, a useful set of analytical tools to tackle Castaldi's difficult and elusive stories of mothers and daughters crushed under the weight of social and historical traumas and saved by the anguished interventions of their author. This is, I have written, this is a writerly text. And I feel, uh, especially mo even more after listening to my, the previous, uh, art, uh, the previous uh, paper, that I have probably violated Gestalt in finding coherence where there is a fragmentation, um, repetition, continuous, temp you know, going off at tangents. But with 721 pages, I could never possibly even try to think of doing what you did with a sonnet. But she's very poetic. Um, 
So, uh, something about Ettinger's uh, theorems. Ettinger asks what meaningful construction could be proposed to make the woman other thing that must be erased in a phallic economy as space of support for the subject. She postulates the emergence of a space of transubjectivity, trans the matrix, in the last months of pregnancy. The encounter between the not yet child and not yet mother in this dynamic matrix of border space not only contributes to the formation of human psyche, but also becomes a general dimension or sphere or element in human subjectivity that operates throughout people's lives, independent of gender and maternal experience. So subjectivity arises from a series of encounters rather than violent separations and splittings taking place in a series of border spaces between at least two always partial subjects who affect one another and produce change. So, <clears throat> this matrix of border space is neither pre-symbolic and therefore it's not unintelligible or anterior to the symbolic, but it's not even an alternative to the symbolic. It is almost like a sub-symbolic adjacent and interwoven with the symbolic, changing the symbolic from within. So this matrixial stratum of subjectivization in this expanded symbolic means that sexual difference arises in this psychic layer rather than through the later castration complex and acquisition of language symbolic competence. So subjectivity as encountered frees mothers and daughters from regressive undifferentiation and radical separation, allowing them to coexist as different yet connected. The matrixel is also marked by and marked a sexual difference with cultural and social geographical specificity, affecting social political relations through two kinds of processes. One results in personal and collective traumas being passed on to later generations in the prenatal matrix and border space, and the other arising from an understanding of the making of human life as transformative ev event encounters between several becoming joined in separateness subjects leads to respect of the other, for the other, and the embracing of diversity. I have a quotation there, and I will, the very first quotation from uh, Griselda Pollock, which just briefly saying that the, um, we, this, this way of looking at um, subjectivity uh, is, um, it leads to a new understanding of the major traumas of modernity in counterforce to the funny conception of difference and its horrendous social forms of intolerance and antagonism, racism, homophobia, misogyny. So, acting your theory of subjectivity is relevant to me um, also because it is supported not only by psychoanalytic practice but also artistic practice aimed at making the matrixial visible and at repairing trauma. And as such, it is relevant to Castaldi's ethical, aesthetic engagement with the maternal that is bound up with European events and traumas, which underpin her characters' lives. Notably, we find the Holocaust, World War II, migrations, racism, but also, for example, the eruption of Vesuvius, uh, in 1979, um, I think, the, 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 the date, the year. Uh, she is from Naples, and so Vesuvius and the precarity of life under the Vesuvius, under Vesuvius is very prominent in her work. So, um, before we move on, we need to consider the use of repetition as a fundamental strategy in both Ettinger's and Castaldi's art, and she is also a sculptor. So, this strategy of repetition makes their art an encounter with trauma, and makes it capable of transmitting um, affects. Ettinger's art 
incorporates what already exists, what she calls the ready-made, such as photographs, photocopies, and maps. But they are series of paintings. And they repeat the same motives with imperceptible differences, which allows the affects slowly, slowly to emerge from the sub-symbolic and be given symbolic expression. So these repetitions are, have been called uh, matrix of refrains, for example, um, which uh, are um, a game almost of a play, a, a, sp a spatial temporal play of appearance and disappearance in her paintings, which lead to an encounter between subjectivities, rego recognition of the others, and change. So change. Um, affects the subject that produces art and possibly those who see that art. So art is the illness as well as the remedy. And so the matrixial gaze activates, which is in the paintings, in the, in the art, also activates um, in the viewers a gaze of, of the same nature which transforms the unwitnessed, what we, the viewer, has not seen, into a knowledge that acting of course witnessing with an H. So that's why I have an H in my title there. So it is a shared witnessing that is done with and beside the other that witnessed. So if we translate Ettinger's aesthetics to narrative, it becomes apparent, apparent that Castaldi's non-realist writing is well suited to make the matrix invisible. I will, uh, I will have to jump some of the, the, the evidence for this, so you can ask me if you want evidence, but I will just talk about repetition, because there is a proliferation of repetition in the work of Castaldi. Um, which brings her close to Ettinger's artistic practice. So the four stories uh, featured in Vento de Mimani Le Tour recount a number of highly charged event encounters over and over again. Many them work like Ettinger's a, uh, a, a, a practice of trauma and a memory of oblivion, bringing back what has been forgotten. So the entwined hands in the title of the book are a key motif running throughout the tetralogy, which contrasts with the drawing of the cover, which I have reproduced on the back here, um, where you have a drawing of a, a, a bust of a woman, a, a woman headless and handless, showing the. Um, for maybe evoking forcefully the impossibility of subjectivity without connection. So this is a, a, a drawing by Castaldi herself. So I presume it's been put there with, an intent, with intention. So the matrix refrain of intertwined hands acts as a cure to traumatic, dis traumatic disconnection in each story. Each story ends with uh, uh, hands between uh, two people and especially mothers and daughters. So we jump now to talk about one particular narrative because there is no time to look at all of them and they are very complex. So I, look, I will look at part three, La Bambola di Pezza, the rag doll, which is the story of a mother and a daughter who have become disconnected after witnessing their husband and father being killed by the Germans during the Second World War. But they managed, they succeed in reconnecting during their last hours in hospital. After the daughter, who is in a wheelchair, has been assaulted and raped by the mob, tired of the clerking of her wheelchair scurrying around night water. We can, I don't have time to tell you why, what's all this, it's too much in this, in this, in this book. So here, <coughs> numerous refrains linked to tragic and violent events conflating different temporalities and personal and collective traumas take us to the death 
at the end of the narrative of mother and daughter. The narrative moves from the young daughter's fall from a balcony while running after her boy to the mother's unflagging efforts to recompose her daughter's shattered body by sewing together body parts that she makes with cloth and chalk, like the, the chalks that were created from the people who were buried by the eruption of the zoo. So then we move on to the mob's assault. Past the happy trips to Pompeii by mother and daughter, the excavation, slide into the description of the hot ash from Vesuvius killing its inhabitants in 79. And the story of the, a, 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 a sketch, a scene of a mother trying to save her child from the hot ash. Or the child rape of their maid, moving on to their time, to their lives in content in 1972. And then, the Holocaust, World War II, Hiroshima. During the last hours, mothers and daughters, their hands entwined, reconnect after the daughter verbalizes the trauma that had interrupted their connection. While they lie with their hands entwined, she recounts the daughter, her father's horrific death. The quick and powerful description of a German soldier Crashing the father's head under his boot is followed by the daughter's jump into the abyss of the balcony. Her fall had been narrated many times before. It's almost on every page of the about 200 pages of this particular narrative. But before, it had never been linked to the father's death. Now, finally, we have a juxtaposition of that. And at this point, the, this juxtaposition suggests that a causal link exists between the two events. She may have jumped intentionally. So the last 50 pages of the story interpolate the refrain of the father's death with the dying daughter's pressing questioning of her mother. The gaze is fundamental to the affects that fill these pages. The mother saw her husband's death from the window, and the daughter saw her mother's gaze, the moment when she gave up on life and on her daughter. The daughter's yearning for her mother's gaze is contrasted with the mother's thunderstruck face and vacant look, detached from her daughter, their home and their previous life. The daughter reveals that she jumped from the balcony out of jealousy of her father, guilt for his death, demand for maternal love, fear of her mother's grief, indifference, and hatred. She asks her mother to let her die by letting go of her hand, demanding stronger proof of her love. She says, a mother's love must be boundless for her to let her child die. As her mother loosens her grip, the grip of her hand, the daughter revise, reviews her decision. She asks her, to hold her hand again, as if to give her mother proof of her own love. Then we have a quote here. Now you hold my hand, and we are together. Now I suffer too for that man who died so badly. He was my father and your husband. We are suffering together. The agony in the garden of Gethsemane. Hold my hand. Keep me company a bit longer, so we can die together. So share the pain, finally, and symbolization of that trauma, of that pain, means that their witnessing becomes Ettinger's witnessing. So we move on towards the end, part four of the book. In this part, the fictional author's subjectivity in connectedness with her characters, with her daughters, with her mother, with her brother, with her reader, emerges and becomes paramount. The role of writing is to remedy traumas through reconnecting the subjects involved. So we go back in this to reflections on the stories that have been told in the previous three parts. So the fictional author is at the same time artist, he writes, therapist, and patient, because she has problems as well. 
but can't go in today. And she has witnessed her character's traumas that reflects upon them with what Ettinger would describe as empathy within compassion and empathy within respecting, namely empathy for them, compassion and respect for the mothers, transferring this understanding of her own, this understanding to her own life and inviting the readers to do the same. So the death of the ragdoll's father returns in part four and provides a very good example of these processes. The author looks at things from the mother's point of view and says life has inundated her with so much blood that she had to put a barrier between herself and everything that moves, even between herself and her daughter. So disconnection. There follows an empathetic portrayal of the German soldier, stressing his youth and lack of understanding of his own actions. We are even taken into the dying husband's mind, who says, he doesn't understand that I'm dying, he's only a kid. And finally, into the soldier's consciousness, to witness he is becoming aware of the atrocities he has committed and his suicide. So like Ettinger's maternal eye, our author operates simultaneously on two levels. From the perspective of a matrixial subjectivity, she establishes border linking with the, her vulnerable characters. But from the post oedipal position, she establishes boundaries, and between herself as well, and her uh, characters. As a mother writer, she says, I have become so many people and things, but I have always felt that they were other from me, that everybody inside Nightwater had their own life which was intertwined with mine. I, had, I was always in the middle, on the edge of a threshold between that which is I and that which is not I, which is a very, uh, resonates very much with the idea of matrix of border space uh, postulated by Ettinger. So in the last 50 pages, she debates her role as witness and creator, drawing a comparison between herself and Primo Levi. Her reader, who is a, a real reader, and actually is her Feltrinelli uh, editor, uh, from the publisher's editor, her reader considers Primo Levi a real witness, which is not, he claimed. And he's entitled to write the atrocity he experienced, experienced and saw. But the author argues that what she invents is more or less real, simply because it cannot be documented in history. And that, in the way invoked, invoked by Hettinger, she is a witness. And she says, I'll try to make you see things that you cannot see unless you walk around them with your imagination. She has fulfilled her responsibility in writing a book that, quote, has stuck in your gullet precisely because it has made you remember things that are no bed of roses. So Castaldi's writing goes beyond witnessing, be becoming matrixial witnessing. Thus, despite the reference to forgetting in the title of this last part, La Dimenticanza, in fact, the, the part four is about remembering. Forgetting here invites an Ettingerian reading. The author's stepping into night water is a method of futurity, her book and memory of oblivion. And now, the real conclusion. Castaldi presents a mother-daughter relations that are warped by historical traumas, such as illnesses, cancer, for example, one of the characters uh, die of cancer, bereavement, death of the father, for example, violence, rape, cataclysms, the Vesuvius, the eruption, and war. Thus, her aesthetic practice, her narrative and rhetorical strategies, is not an exercise in regression to the negative place to which phallic thought relegates the feminine maternal but one of futurity. Bringing to light the traces of the maternal means attempting to restore the matrixial potential for subject-to-subject -subject interconnection, which is necessary for the resolution of trauma. 
the traumas of Castaldi's mothers and daughters originates in traumas of our era. Consequently, death, which is the motor of the Intolimimani Ritua, is never only a personal or a human universal experience, but also and always a community event. She brings Italian and European traumas, historical traumas, out of oblivion, forcing us to reflect on our shared moral obligations and encouraging us to take responsibility for change. Thank you.